So I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about my perspectives um, in terms of healthcare innovation um, as a heart surgeon. And uh, these are some words um, that I uh, took from the white paper that was released by IHL, which everyone should read if you haven't. And I think the, these um, uh, statements here really summarize a lot of the major issues that uh, we'll probably focus on in this session. One is that we all know we want healthcare to be leading edge. There's no question about that. Patients are demanding that. We all expect that. We must pursue innovation. So we, we know that we need to innovate. That, there's no question about that. Probably when we talk about innovation, we're really, um, in many ways, talking about introducing new healthcare technology. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about introduction of healthcare technology and how that affects our practices. And also the important point of commercialization is what is the role of commercialization in our publicly funded healthcare system? How can we do that better and should we do that better? Well, interestingly enough, we got a grade of D um, in terms of our ability to innovate in our healthcare system. And um, it's, it's really striking to me that um, in our healthcare system, we have an amazing universities, we have amazing doctors, we have amazing opportunities, but yet we don't successfully commercialize a lot of our research. And I think that's a, a big problem for our system. And that's been identified by iChill. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, something I'm trying to do to um, improve that process. Well, some of the main issues that come out of um, uh, iChill that strike a chord with me are how can we create and foster this culture of innovation? I think that's extremely important because we don't see that. We see certain individuals and certain physicians um, who have that culture of innovation but they're, um, they're isolated and they don't often get the support of their colleagues and, and we need um, to improve that. What is the most effective process for innovation adoption in this universal publicly funded system? And I think that's a very important question for our panel and they come from all different perspectives and I'm, I'm excited to hear from them about how they think we can do this. And what is the impact of medical devices on healthcare? This is extremely important to me um, as a surgeon. As surgeons, we're often the ones who implant these different medical devices. And it's very important for us to um, know what the impact is and, and how we can support that impact. So here's an example of something that I do. I implant um, artificial heart pumps in patients. These are fully implantable. Um, well, not fully. There's a little drive line that comes out of the skin. But these are. this is amazing technology. When I started my training, this didn't exist. This was a dream that people have had for a long, long time. Heart surgery is not even that old. There, you know, when at the turn of the century, people thought that you could never do heart surgery. Now we have a point where we have implantable heart pump technology that we can take a patient who essentially has no heart function at all, who would be dead, and we can put in this amazing heart pump and put it on a battery pack and a patient can live a pretty much a normal life. This has evolved even in just in the last five years to the point where we now have artificial heart pumps. These are larger ones, ones that fit in, the, in your hand. Well, this changes the game a lot. This changes how we're going to treat heart disease. This opens up a lot of important issues for what we're going to do with these patients. These pumps are not cheap. This right now, they're about $100,000. But you can live longer and feel a lot better. So there's enormous benefits uh, to this technology. I had a patient who's 27 years old, who's otherwise healthy, um, came into the hospital um, in shock, and his heart was essentially dead, and it was not fixable. I put him on one of these artificial heart pumps and bridged him to a transplant over the next six months, and he's now fine. Um, this is uh, his hockey helmet. They called him the Tin Man. All his friends called him Tin Man because he didn't have a heart anymore. He had an artificial heart pump, and his dad put it in a glass box for him as a memento. This is a striking case of a patient who would be dead without a medical device. So these devices are extremely important. I don't think anyone would argue that we did, we did the right thing for this patient. We put in one of these devices and we saved his life and it cost the system, yeah, a lot of money. But here's a guy who's going to live the rest of his life fairly normal. But what if he was 78, not 28? I mean, and what if he had other uh, illness? What if he had strokes in the past and some renal failure and some lung problems? Where do we draw the line? And now that we have this, what is the um, impact for me as a physician? I have these on the shelf. I'm able to put them in. How do I say no to a patient? And when, when do I say no? And how many can we put in? And how long can we sustain these patients? These are important questions, and I'm not sure how we're going to answer all these questions. Well, I want to talk about innovation, and I, I find it interesting. I do research in a lab. Where we're working on tissue engineering and stem cells and trying to develop new technologies. And I go from the lab where we're spending all this money and all this time trying to develop new technology, and then I go to see my patient on the ward, 
And then I see our system failing us um, even in simple ways. And I'm going to give you an example uh, where I was working in a hospital uh, nearby here during my training. And on the nursing station, the nursing station is really like the sort of central hub of um, the ward where it's almost like the air traffic control center, the patient all get coordinated through there. And the chart rack is a very important part of that because the chart rack takes all the charts and the patients need to go with their chart and that's how with physicians and nurses and everybody communicate through the chart. And the chart rack in this particular institution was really small. The charts didn't seem to really fit into the chart rack. And as a result, the charts were scattered all over the ward, everywhere. You could never find the chart. You could never find the patient in the chart. And I actually had a patient whose, pa whose surgery got canceled um, because they couldn't get the right test because they couldn't find the chart and couldn't get the patient in time for the test. So the surgery got canceled, so that slot went unfilled. And then the waiting list probably got longer, and who knows what happened to a patient who was waiting for surgery just because the chart didn't fit in the rack. That was my impression. So I suggested to someone that maybe we should just get a bigger chart rack to allow these charts to fit, and maybe these patients would get to their surgeries on time. It's a microcosm of larger issues. Came back six months later, and the chart rack was still the same, and the charts were everywhere. So I don't know what happened. Probably uh, it got into somebody's hands, and there was no budget for a new chart rack, and who knows whether it would have made an impact. But that's a simple thing that maybe seemed to have a complex implementation. We just didn't change. And a lot of what we do as physicians and nurses on our shift is we just try to manage that shift. We try to get through it. We try to work around the system. We don't think about changing the system. We just try to work through it. We try to get our patients safe and to what they need despite the system. And I think we need to change that. And that's the culture of innovation we need on the ward. I'm going to talk about another example of something I worked on, which is a little more complicated. It's something called kryptonite. And it's a, a special new um, bone adhesive that has um, some pretty remarkable properties. In fact, the guy who um, found this um, is a physician and engineer who trained uh, just here at the University of Toronto. And he heard about this sort of sticky stuff that they were using uh, down in South America. And they actually um, put some of this on a broken uh, bill of this toucan. You can see that um, little section there. And they put, this, put his beak back together. And the bird was able to um, crack nuts and survive within a few hours after this formed. So the implications when this engineer heard of this were enormous, that if we could do this for patients, probably we could innovate in terms of healing bones and et cetera. So he started a company, and um, they were pursuing orthopedic surgical applications and trauma surgery applications, which makes a lot of sense. Well, my patients, I've noticed, um, they come out of the operating room with a fixed heart, but they really suffer over the next couple of months from a delayed recovery from the fact that we have to cut through their breastbone. And that breastbone has to heal over a period of weeks and fuse for them to get out of pain and to make a full recovery and get back to work. So really, um, what I thought was maybe we can use this amazing stuff to improve recovery for our patients. Maybe they'll have less pain, they'll have better breathing, and they'll get out of hospital faster and get back to work earlier. So I tried it, and I did some proof of concept testing and models, and, and it looked good. And then I did a clinical trial at, in Calgary, and uh, the results were um, fantastic. And we uh, published some of these results. We presented them at meetings. And the result was that we got a lot of attention about this because it really struck a chord with the patients. And in fact, people started doing this within a short period of time in um, other countries around the world. I got emails and phone calls from surgeons and from patients. And it really took off. And it's a, nowadays, these things happen very quickly. So the integration of new technology is very fast. It's so fast that we can't even keep up with it in terms of our research and our testing and our clinical trials and the funding of our clinical trials. I just got back from Australia, and there's some surgeons who are using this almost routinely in their practice. I just did the first case maybe a year and a half ago. Um, so this is quite incredible how quickly wor world tra um, word travels and how quickly patients find out and patients are now demanding this from, their, from the surgeons. How, you know, where, where do we decide that this is ready for um, full-blown use? Should we be paying for it? I applied it to Alberta Health Services to say I wanted to use this uh, for my patients. They looked at all of my data and said, well, we're not ready to fund this yet. You need to do a much larger clinical trial. And yet, the orthopedic surgeons in the hospital can actually buy it and use it because it's a different application. So half, a lot of things we do don't even have any evidence, but yet they're funded. So 
how do we how do we balance all of these issues? And I'm going to suggest to you that medical device innovation is a is a strange process. We like to think of it as this linear process where you identify a need, you make an invention with some technical input, and then you go and implement it, and it gets clinically adopted. But really, it's not like that. It's really very much an ongoing process. So when we want to work with devices, there, it's really there's constant input, there's constant cycling, there's constant revisions. Um, it's a much more complex. Uh, cycle and we need to recognize that there's a lot of barriers to that even the fact of how do we train our physicians on all this new technology and when are they ready to uh, integrate it well recognizing that I, I thought that we need something different we need to have better communication with um, industry with academia hospitals government we need to work together if we want to take technology and integrate it properly and take it through the whole process especially if we want to actually commercialize it here in Canada so what I did was I took some ideas to my friends at Blue Pebble Health, which is a um, healthcare consulting company, it has an office right across the street actually. They are sponsors of, um, as, you, as you're aware, they're sponsors of this um, uh, conference, which I think is great. And uh, for some of the students, you might be interested in contacting them when you're done, that there may be opportunities for you. But we came up with a concept called the Health Innovation Research Commercialization Alliance. And this is really a non-profit alliance. They just helped me build this um, using all their skills. And what this is aimed at doing is providing a venue for health sector stakeholders to really discuss, collaborate, and establish methods and processes to break down these barriers and identify best practices. So we talked a lot about this throughout the meeting, is how are we going to communicate and how are we going to work together to break down some of these barriers and learn from each other. And these days, with all of the social networking um, capacity that we have and all the technology that we have, we should be able to do this. And I know nobody wants any more emails and nobody wants to be uh, um, on Facebook, uh, et cetera, uh, more so than they already are. But this is something different. We're trying to take some of this social networking uh, concepts and some of the technology and then apply it in a different way. So what we've developed is um, this uh, Herca portal where we're able to collaborate uh, we can work on documents together. Um, there's a blog where we can exchange information. Um, we can profile each other and find out who's out there. Sometimes we just don't know who to contact or uh, who's available. So this is a, um, uh, it's a work in progress. The, the site is live now. Um, we're doing it by invitation only. Everybody here is invited to participate because you guys are all obviously care about the system. And um, we look forward to uh, uh, building this over time and, and helping to work together. So maybe it's a small piece, whether it will make a huge difference, I don't know, but I think it's worth a try.